Welcome uh, to my session on uh, secure and managed APIs using uh, GraphQL. Uh, so my name is uh, Ozer Sheikh. I'm a product manager, uh, program director at, uh, at IBM. Uh, and um, so, you know, to, first off, I just want to thank you to uh, the, the staff here, uh, Eleven Labs, uh, for putting on this track. It's my first time at uh, API Days in Paris, and uh, it's been a wonderful session. So uh, I know it's uh, closing down, so I appreciate uh, you guys coming uh, to hear my session. Uh, if you want uh, to uh, see some of the articles I've written uh, around GraphQL, I have a tutorial. You can check out my uh, Medium link, um, and also you can connect with me uh, on LinkedIn. Okay, so uh, before I start talking about uh, GraphQL, uh, I wanted to uh, step back and, uh, and give you a little bit of a history lesson <laughs> in, in, in how we got to, to GraphQL. Uh, you know, I, I, I think in, when I look at technology, you know, we're always coming up with new technology and often solving you know, some, the same problem or, or solving it in, in a different way, right? And so when I looked at GraphQL the first time, uh, that was my first impression. I'm like, well, you know, we already have REST. Do we really need something else like a GraphQL, right? So, you know, I started to do some, some investigation. And at the same time, I had this pessimism because I just spent a year learning Angular, right? Angular 2, because they said Angular 1, no, you know. So, you know, after a year, you know, I learned it, and then I realized, I just checked, there's like Angular 7 now. And not only that, everyone says, well, don't, don't, don't use Angular anymore. It's all about React now. So I'm like, well, do I really need to learn, you know, another way of doing like a, an input control and validation in a web form? Like I'm, I'm done with it, right? But anyways, I, you know, not to get off on a tangent, right? You know, I, I, I want to understand, you know, is, is GraphQL just like another way of creating a, a web control? But, and, or is there really some, some unique value that I'm getting by using GraphQL? So, um, so, so let's kind of, let's step back in our history, right? So, um, you know, I, uh, I don't want to do a full history lesson, so I kind of went back as, as to how much I know ab about the, the quote-unquote API space. And, and this is what I call API 1.0, right? You know, service-oriented architectures. How many people here are familiar with SOA? Right? So, so, so most of the folks here, right? Um, you know, in, in, in the SOA days, right, the, the main goal was I had, you know, I had a system here, maybe it was .NET, and I had another system here, which was Java, and I needed a way for those two systems to talk to one another in a common, you know, you know format, right? So, so SOAP was the, the messaging format, you know, WSDL was the way to describe the service, you know, in, in a standard format, right? But, you know, what, what quite often was that, you know, and I kind of put up this kind of WhatsApp chat here, and given the history, maybe I should use something like, you know, ICQ or something, right? Uh, but, you know, the, the, the API provider, you know, they created the interface, right? Um, and it was quite often very tied closely to the implementation. And they just kind of handed it over to the API consumer, right? And they said, hey, look, just call my API. It's, it's easy. You know, here's the, here's the contract. You, oh, yeah, yes, there's like, so, there's like WSDL to Java generation tools. They'll create you a stub and everything. And, you know, if, for folks who've kind of been around, right, they, you know, it wasn't always the most trivial process. They, it, 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 it involved some time to, to get it right. Um, and so, you know, if, if I were to kind of look back, I would have to say in, in this API 1.0 world, right, it was really the provider which was kind of driving things, right, because it was its interface, its contract, it was SOAP, you know, so it wasn't as easy to consume, um, and, and the consumer was really at the mercy, you know, of that contract, okay? So if we kind of forward a bit, you know, I call it API 2.0, right? Well, again, I'm just making this up, right? Because anytime you screw up, you just come out with 2.0 and it's going to fix everything, right? That's, that's what we like to do in technology, right? So, so in API 2.0 or, or, or REST, right? You know, we represented our, uh, our interfaces using Swagger or, or open API specifications. We, we modeled our services using, you know, REST, right? And, uh, and, you know, the advantage of REST was, well, I can take advantage of the underlying HTTP protocol, leverage some of its caching, and take this resource-based approach in terms of how I define you know, my services. It, it was much more easier for a consumer to consume because it's clear that, hey, a get is getting me information. You know, a, a post is, you know, up, you know, is creating something in, in the back end, 
right? So, so the, the mapping between the way the, the HTTP protocol defined the resource was, was really self-readable, right? And, and, and second um, was that, you know, we moved away from just like throwing these uh, WSDL files or WSDL files uh, over to the consumer. Right? We said, you know what, we need to focus on the user experience. Right? So we provided developer portals. Right? And the developer portals will publish your swaggers. You can go in, you, there's documentation, you know, and you can subscribe to the API. You can even test out the API. Right? And I didn't, you know, if we kind of look at this WhatsApp conversation, right? no longer am I passing over that WSDL to the, to the consumer, but rather, I'm giving them a link to the dev portal and saying, hey, look, here's my, you know, here's my APIs. Learn about them. Call them. Hey, you have questions. You know, we've got forums. Ask questions. And you know, we're here to help you. Right? So as an API consumer, I'm starting to feel better about this, uh, this whole you know, uh, API thing. Right? So if we look at 2.0 here, right, it's kind of a tie. Right? Like both sides are really benefiting here. The provider's benefiting because it's adhering to you know, RESTful you know, standards, leveraging HTTP, using a, a more uh, self-describing way uh, of, um, of, their, of, of publishing their API. Um, and it, it makes life easier for the consumer. They've got dev portals. They can read documentation. Right? So you know, it, things are they're, they're getting better. Right? So now, we enter what I like to say API 3.0. And again, there's probably no such thing as 3.0 in the technology industry. Because if you screw up 2.0, then you're coming out with like API Reborn or you know, something else, right? <laughs> so, so anyways, you know, 3.0 is what I'm going to call it, right? And so we're, we're in this era of, uh, of, of say, GraphQL. And I, and, I, and I think, and if you read the blog, I, this is, you know, in my opinion, going to be a, uh, you know, one of the next big technologies in this API space. Um, and, and so, if, if you know, there's, I, I think every single talk in this track has had one or two slides about what is GraphQL. So, so I'm going to spend very little time on describing what it is. But you know, in, in essence, it's it's a it's a query language, you know, for your APIs, right? Um, it leverages the kind of the graph-like nature of your backends, um, and it's specific and it's especially useful for for when you've got very data uh, in, in intensive services, right? Um, you know, the, the common example that we hear a lot is that, you know, if, if you got like a mobile application, right, and you need to uh, populate or build a UI uh, of your application, you know, if the, if, the, if the data that you need is not available in a single API call, what, you know, what often happens is you ask your, your backend teams to create your custom endpoint, well, now you've got another endpoint to manage, or, you know, you have to make multiple calls, right? And so, you know, what, what to me, it is, it is GraphQL has really shifted some of the complexity from the from the front end to the back end, right? It hasn't really taken it away, right? You know, if if, if there is data that exists in five different databases, you know, GraphQL is a great platform to get you that information, but that doesn't take away from the fact that it's still complex, right? It's more complex than it is on the front end, right? The front end, right? He makes one call. He gets exactly the data that he needs. He can build his UI. Life is good, right? But the back end, you know, if there's a front end guy and a back end guy working together in the office, I'm telling you, the front end guy is going home like at five o'clock, right? You know, he, he's like, hey, you, your back is not working. I'll just stub you, right? I'll stub the data. I'm good, right? The back end guy is probably like, oh, my second out of my fifth call resolver failed. You know, he's, he, it's, it's, you know, at the end of the day, you know, obviously GraphQL provides a runtime that, that optimizes that, that, that flow for you. But again, it, it, again it, it really comes back to my point. The, the complexity is more or less shifted from the front end into the, the, the back end. And so it really simplifies whose life? The consumer, the developer, right? Because it makes his life, because he can focus on what he should be focusing on, and that is building great user experiences, right? So, you know, he can focus on, I guess, like, I got to learn React now, right? Because, like, you know, no one's using Angular, right? <laughs> well, plus GraphQL is, like, you know, embedded into React, so probably a good investment right now. Um, but, you know, it's great for the API consumer, and, or, you know, or say, you know, the developer, right? But there is a but. Are we giving too much control to the developer, right? 
You know, you guys probably say, no, 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 right? We're, we would never do anything wrong. We know exactly the calls we need to make, right? But, you know, maybe we need to protect, ourse- protect us from ourselves, right? So, b- before I kind of get into, you know, what that protection is, it's fundamental to, to understand the differences between GraphQL uh, and REST. And, and, and those differences will help you understand where the value of GraphQL is and where the value of REST is, right? So if you look at a, a REST API, right, everything is defined as a resource, right? So in that first example, I can get, you know, profile information, right? It's clear, I'm, I'm, I'm getting some uh, information. Or uh, I'm doing a, a post, right? Again, a resource. So I'm going to be creating something in, in, in the back end, right? Now, GraphQL is different though, right? Gra- GraphQL gives you a single endpoint. In that endpoint, you look at the URI. Do you know what type of action is going to be performed? No. You have to look at the body, right? And the body, right, in the first example is, well, I'm doing a, a query here. So I'm going to get back, you know, information, right? So... So, uh, you know, very similar to, to the get one, but it, it's in the body. Uh, but, and also in, in, in the second example, uh, I'm doing a post. Uh, and so in that post, I'm adding a mutation, so I'm going to be changing some states uh, on the back end. So, so some key differences. Number one, right, single endpoint on a, on a GraphQL uh, request, right? You have to look at the body to really understand what is being performed, right? Um, and so if you kind of compare the two between uh, GraphQL and REST, you know, and, and I think everybody's been very consistent in, in the answer today across all the speakers, GraphQL is not replacing REST. It provides an alternative to REST. It's great for data intensive uh, uh, services because it gives you the flexibility to get the data, the exact data that you want, right? REST is still needed, right? REST is optimized for the HTTP protocol. So you can uh, take advantage of the inherent caching that gets built into it, right? And the fact that, you know, you've got multiple endpoints, it allows you to, uh, you know, really understand what action is being performed just by looking, you know, at the, at the URI. Okay. So, another key point, right, that, that needs to be understood. Okay. So, when I make a single GraphQL call, right, typically in the REST world, I'm going to get back, you know, it's going to, the compute time of that call on my back end is, you know, it's pretty much going to be the same, or it's going to be a one-to-one with the actual request being performed, okay? Whereas in a, in a GraphQL call, one call may make multiple calls on the back end, right? So if any of you guys attended the, 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 uh, the talk this morning with, uh, I believe it was Nicholas from GitHub, you know, they, they have this concept of, uh, of, of um, uh, I guess, tokens or, 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 or being able to um, uh, articulate a, a, a call, uh, the, the complexity of a call, right, for the lack of a better term. And, and that is to really understand that, you know, just bec- in the GraphQL world, the compute time of making that one call could be much more and it's likely much more than it would be for that same, you know, REST call. And that's because that one call may call multiple backends. So in this example, you know, um, I, I wrote this, this sports, you know, um, uh, query. So I might get information about players. Now those players, there might be another table or another service that holds information about all the teams. So that players needs to call teams. So you can see that I can have, you know, multiple resolvers that could be executed for a single GraphQL, you know, call. Okay. So, so the compute time between a GraphQL call and REST call is different. A GraphQL call is likely to be more expensive than a REST call. Okay. So, to to really understand a potential impact of that, you know, I like to look at kind of another query language. And again, this is just for demonstration purposes, right? So. Remember what we said in, in API 3.0, right? We gave power to the developer, the consumer, right? To be able to make whatever calls they needed to get the data they want, right? Which is great as a developer, but right? What I said, well, sometimes we have to protect us against ourselves, right? So what are, what are some of the things we've learned from, from, from SQL and databases? What about that dreaded select all from the table query, 
right? Yeah, it's, it's okay when there's 10 records, but what if there's a million records, right? You know, that can really overwhelm your backend infrastructure, right? What about, you know, a query where you're doing, you know, multiple joins that are nesting, you're getting large amounts of data that are dispersed across multiple tables. Again, that can, you know, choke up a, a, a lot of backend, you know, compute time. Okay, so, so whether it's say a newbie developer who, you know, who doesn't, uh, who, you know, who's made, who, who shouldn't be making these types of calls, or even a malicious, you know, um, developer, right, who might be trying to do some sort of SQL injection, right? How many people here are familiar with SQL injection, right? So a lot of you guys are, right? So again, like th those are, you know, valid queries, but when structured, when put with some malicious data, can give us unintended consequences, right? Getting data that we shouldn't be allowed to get access to, okay? So this kind of comes to the, the key point <laughs> of my talk here, um, and, and that is we need API management of GraphQL, okay? And this is not the same API management that we can apply to, to REST, right? Because why? There's fundamentally differences between a REST call and a GraphQL call. Right? What was one of those differences? One GraphQL call can make multiple calls on the back end. So the complexity or the compute time of that call can have a very significant impact, right? If, if you look at the, you know, GitHub's a great example, right? If you look at their, um, their API documentation, you know, they'll, they have a max in terms of the number of, uh, you know, APIs you can call, and that's because they take this fact into consideration, right? That that one call might return you, say, a thousand repositories, right? And that should be reflected in terms of how much APIs you're actually allowed to call, right? And it could be from a, a rate limit point of view, so if you're familiar with API management, perhaps you want to rate limit the number of API calls that the consumer can do, you know, or, it could be simply based on some sort of throttling or, or you know, some of you may be familiar with circuit breaker-like patterns, right? Because one call could potentially impact the infrastructure, right, um, and could, could bring down system resources, right? So, so typically you want to have this notion of a, a fail fast, right? Or you want to implement some sort of throttling in your backend systems so that, you know, you can protect against these you know, these queries that can overwhelm, you know, your systems, right? So, you know, if you could just kind of look at this, this graph here, right? So again, like GraphQL, as the name implies, is, you know, it, it's a graph data structure, right? And so that in itself lends itself to um, the ability to have a lot of complex data that could be, you know, potentially returned, right? You know, one of the things that we do in, you know, in, in API management, right, is that even for like XML or, or JSON payloads, you know, you want to do early detection of, of messages that could be maliciously crafted, right? Like an XML message probably never needs to be a thousand levels deep, uh, you know, in terms of its payload structure, right? Um, however, what's the impact of a, of a thousand nested field in an XML payload, right? It's going, it's going to, if it ever hits your back end, it's going to chew up system resources um, and in effect, it can have this, you know, kind of blast radius of impacting, you know, other systems that, that are, are nearby. So, it's important that, you know, we apply some of these throttling and rate limit principles as we do with traditional API management with REST and SOAP workloads, but we have to take into consideration the uniqueness of, of what GraphQL brings us. So, that's the motivation, right? So now let's look at what does it really mean to do API management of, of GraphQL, okay? Um, and I'll talk about kind of two key things. One is around, you know, threat protection, and the second is around kind of uh, rate limiting. Okay, so, you know, just a plug here. So this is something that, you know, we're working on in, in IBM research, and, and this, this notion of that, let me just kind of fully animate this out. Oh, one more. This notion of that if you want to do proper API management of your GraphQL queries, um, you want to have that performed on a gateway that sits in front of your GraphQL server, okay? Um, and that's in line 
with what you do with rest and what you do with soap, right? Um, and so it's, it's different in the sense that when, um, when a query comes in for, from GraphQL, you have no clue what the impact of that query is going to be, right? I want to select, you know, select all my favorite players from my, you know, my, my, you know, my players uh, service, right? Do I know that that one player service could call multiple services in the back end just from that query? No idea, right? So, you know, what we're working on is, and I think this, this will hopefully be the industry best practice around this, is that the gateways need to work with the GraphQL servers, right? Because it's important to keep those two co concepts separate, right? Gateways need to focus on, gateways need to focus on security, Right? Um, they need to, not, not only for GraphQL, but for other services, um, and then let GraphQL do what it's really good at, and, and that's being able to implement the resolvers um, and being able to return the data in an efficient manner. So, you know, the way kind of this is modeled out, and this is uh, quite technical here, but, but the idea is that through introspection, right, the, the gateways can learn about the schema from the GraphQL servers. Okay. And by learning about the, uh, the, the schemas, it can start to build some static analysis around it, right? Because, you know, you could, looking at a schema, you, you know that, you know, if I'm getting players, maybe I'm getting some teams, I'm getting information about, you know, the arenas from those teams. You, you roughly have an idea of some of the complexity or the number of uh, nesting, number of levels or resolvers that are, that could be executed for a potential uh, GraphQL query. Okay. Um, and, and so, you know, this is, you know, something that, uh, you know, I think can be easily built, right? And, and so we, we've kind of built that, you know, in, in our gateway product. And so with that knowledge, then we start to do policy enforcement, you know, on, on, on those GraphQL requests, right? So what are some of those things? Like, number one, we talked about threat detection, right? Again, I, I want to ensure that that, that GraphQL query is not going to bring down my backend systems. Or maybe I just want to ensure a fair use of resources from my consumers, right? So that, you know, if, if a consumer is making a call, I'll, you know, I want to ensure that maybe maximum that they can execute is three resolvers on, on the backend, right? Um, and also, when, and we'll talk a little bit about, about rate limiting, right? So if, if you're familiar with this notion of API plans, right? Uh, you know, GraphQL is a premium service, and so there should be a way for us to market that, right? And so we'll, we'll talk about that in, in a little bit. Okay, so just to kind of finish up here, right? So again, and, and the key point here is that for, for really any sort of enforcement, security enforcement, or API management to be done on a GraphQL, you know, the recommendation is not to do it in the GraphQL server. It's always a best practice to separate out your security logic from your back end, be able to do the enforcement there, right? And, you know, basically make a yay or nay decision around uh, whether you allow that, you know, GraphQL query to be executed. Okay. So some, some technical details here, um, you know, I'm not going to go through it in, but line by line, but, but the idea here is that if we look at that static analysis that, that I talked about earlier, by, by introspecting the, the schema from the GraphQL server, we can start to build up some idea of the complexity of that schema and then, you know, be able to generate metadata around, you know, how complicated can this query be? How much nesting is there going to be? Right? This could be potentially, think about like threat detection, right? Because if something is nested multiple levels, you know, going back to my earlier example, that multiple levels, right, if uh, that message is able to go through to the back end, can, you know, um, require a large amount of, of compute, of, of, of CPU, right? You know, look at, you know, type counts, right? You know, the amount of users or, you know, amount of attributes that, that say I'm, I'm going to be returning. Um, and you may want to think about maybe controlling the amount uh, of, 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 of the items that you can have returned and perhaps even, you know, offering, you know, like a premium service that, hey, do you want to get more than 10? Well, maybe that's a different plan that, that, that you uh, may offer to, to your developers, right? Um, and then, you know, type complexity, right? So this could just simply be that, um, you know, how, how complex like, is the backend call that you're making? How much resolvers are you uh, being, are you executing? And making sure that, 
you know, you're taking that into consideration when you're designing any sort of rate plans, you know, around your APIs. So, in, so the first one, you know, threat detection, right? So, so I, you know, I've given you some of the kind of the technical details around it, the, the architecture, but at the end of the day, you know, what the, what the analysis will tell you is whether you feel like it's a valid request or an invalid request. And being able to do that threat detection upfront before it ever hits the, the backend server is always the best practice. Okay. You may, you know, by doing some of those static analysis, be able to even pre-calculate the load, right? Uh, understand, you know, what the potential uh, expense of that call could be, and then be able to determine if this is something that I want to allow get passed, you know, to the back end, right? And like I said, a great example of this is, um, uh, is GraphQL, uh, sorry, is GitHub's GraphQL API, right? So they have this concept of a node, right? And so they, you know, and it's a great page, you can Google their V4 API, and it will tell you as you walk through the different kind of levels of data that gets returned, you know, what is the, the calculation, what's the overall node size that, um, you know, that, is, that gets calculated, uh, and then based off the number of nodes that be calculated, it, it'll, then, you know, you could, you know, either make that call or you may have to reduce the number of nodes that, that you're returning. They even give you an API that allows you to pre-query it to see, hey, am I going to make this call? Am I going to be within that, you know, allowable limit? So, great example of, you know, being able to, to really understand the impact of what a potential GraphQL query could have on, on your back end and to provide a user experience for your consumers, developers, so that you um, make sure that they use this in, in, in the right way. Okay. And then, you know, the second part uh, is really around, you know, API plans, right? So, you know, how many people here are familiar with this concept of API plans? Okay, so a few of you guys. So, you know, I, I think the, the most common example that, you know, I, I can think of is something like the Google Maps API, right? So as a developer, you want to embed maps into your application. Say you're a bank, right? You want to be able to provide a store locator, or it could be a retail, doesn't matter. Um, so you as a developer go out to Google Maps, and they'll say, okay, well, you know, for the first 2,500 calls, you know, it's free, right? So this way it gives you the ability to try it out, you know, see what the, see if the user experience makes sense for, for your application. Then, you know, after the first, you know, tw after the, the first 2,500, you know, there'll be another plan, right? Another tier that you may get moved up to where you've you may have to, to pay if you want to be able to make additional, you know, API calls. Right? So again, it's, it's, it's kind of like your standard, you know, tier-based pricing model, right? You've got your free plan, right? But then you've got other plans based off of how much um, requests, and that's typically the models in APIs, is really based off the number of, of, of requests that you're going to be making, and that will determine, you know, which kind of tier that, you know, you ultimately end up with, right? So if, if we start to look at GraphQL and compare it to some the other services, I just put Kafka here as an example because you always want to have three of something any time you describe uh, any concept. Uh, the, 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 to me, like if, if I'm a developer, right, and say I need to build a UI and I look at the schema and I say, okay, well, I got to call all these different APIs, I got to manage the data that comes back. Again, it, it's a lot of work for the developer, right? This is API 2.0, right? You know. It's, it's better than 1.0, right? You know, I've got, I've got a, a better user experience. But still, I, there's still some complexity for me on the front end, okay? Whereas, you know, API 3.0, GraphQL, you know, I'm going home at five, right? You know, the backend developer is still probably working since I'm gone, right? So for me, the, the user experience of using GraphQL is much better than, say, using REST, right? So as an API provider, why, why not try to, to monetize that, right? Because, you know, if it, it's, it's like any product in the market today. People are willing to pay for an enhanced user experience. So you may decide that I may offer up an API that could be REST-based, but then I may offer up another API based off of GraphQL. That could be in a different tier. That could potentially be something you want to, you know, monetize, right? Again, monetization is a completely different topic here, but, but the point that I want to just demonstrate here is that, 
you know, GraphQL is a premium service, so why not treat it like that when you're offering API plans to your, you know, to your developers, to your you know, API consumers? Okay. So you know, I've seen kind of this notion of good, better, and, and best, right? Again, it's arbitrary as to which one's the best one. I think it's safe to say that as a developer, if you had the, the choice between REST and GraphQL, you probably would choose GraphQL because it gives you the, the flexibility. Um, and so that's you know, where the, kind of the best comes in, at least for, for GraphQL. And so you know, it may not end there, right? You may have GraphQL, but again, going back to that earlier example um, where I said one single uh, uh, GraphQL call may call multiple resolvers on the back end, right? So the compute time of that GraphQL call can be, you know, more expensive, right? So again, that could be something you may want to monetize, right? So as a developer, you know, if, if you, you know, something like I think GitHub, I'm coming back to that example because I think it's a, it's a great example of an API. There's just so much data that is available around repositories, pull requests, you know, users, right? So you can imagine just the number of services that you may have to call in, in, in the REST use case. But by having the ability to do this in GraphQL makes it much easier. But you may then want to, again, offer it as a premium service that says, well, okay, so you're, you're kind of going across all these different services here. You know, if I'll limit you at like five or 10, right, and I'm just kind of making up these numbers, right, uh, and you know, you have to pay a little bit extra, you get that extra flexibility, right? You know, or you can bump you up to the highest tier. You know, I'll give you a hundred, right? At that point, you pretty much can go crazy. You get whatever data you want. You know, again, you're, you know, you're, uh, you're offering. Uh, it's it's a premium service, so you could potentially monetize it, or maybe you even have different infrastructure that's looking for, you know, rate limits for these particular plans, right? So again, it it really comes back to looking at GraphQL as a premium service and then evolving that into traditional API management and the concept of plans, right? And then have, by, by adding this categorization to your APIs with, with, you know, with GraphQL, you have the ability, even from an infrastructure point of view, to provide differentiated qualities of service, right? You know, if, if, I'm, if I'm on you know, the five-star plan and you know, maybe if I'm on, say, the first plan, the good plan, it's multi-tenant, right? Everybody's shared, right? That's how public cloud works, right? As soon as you start paying, right? You know, that's when, oh, okay, not, and, hey, we'll give you some isolation, right? Well, we've got to cover our costs, right, from as, as, a, as cloud providers, right? So, um, you know, in that case, you can also then offer up different infrastructure to help support these types of requirements because, again, the compute time of that particular GraphQL call is likely to be more expensive. Okay, so I know I had a lot more time, but uh, I kind of stuck to the kind of the average time for a lot of these sessions. Um, so just to summarize, and then if you guys have any questions, I'm more than happy to uh, to stay and, and and answer them. But number one, you know, GraphQL. It again, if we go back to uh, API 3.0, it it's really empowering the API consumer, right? Making its life easier, improving its developer experience, right? And it's it's amazing, especially when you've got very data intensive services, right? Because it takes away a lot of the complexity of managing that data, you know, from the back end, right? But with, with this shift to the consumer, right? As developers, you know, yes, we're trustworthy 99.9% .9 of the time, right? But maybe that point one, we need to protect us against ourselves and there's always the rogue hacker, right? So we cannot ignore the fact that we need API management. Right? We need API management to be able to protect the infrastructure, right? You know, being able to do things like circuit breakers, right? And we also need API management to be able to control consumer access to make sure consumers are not calling, you know, our APIs more than they should, so that we can institute this idea of a rate limit, right? Because you know, a REST call is not the same compute time as a GraphQL call, right? And so we need API management to be able to help us differentiate. Uh, between the two. Okay. And then finally, this notion of API plans and taking into this consideration that GraphQL is a premium service, right? Because it's really giving the developer, it's making the developer's life easier. So why not offer that as a differentiated plan, whether you want to monetize it, whether you want to just um, differentiate it in your developer portal, 
you know, be able to then tag it with different infrastructure. You know, many options on, on how you want to approach it. But, but you know, you know I, I would, no, I, I don't think there's any disagreement, but uh, developers will see the value and the benefit of using, say, GraphQL, especially when they have the choice, you know, between, say, uh, REST. All right, so that's it. If you guys uh, have any questions, uh, I can answer them here, or uh, you can come up afterwards, and I'm uh, more than happy to chat.